All right, great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming on this call. Uh, we're going to be beginning, and uh, this is the post IYLA or International Young Leaders Assembly discussion. Uh, we're really happy to uh, have a follow up uh, program after our International Young Leaders Assembly that happened actually about a week ago, uh, which concluded at the United Nations. Uh, so I want to be able to welcome all of you from, uh, I can't see who's online, but I'm really happy to welcome delegate all of you from all around the world, uh, whether it's uh, from the United States or even from different countries. So good morning, good afternoon, and also hope you're enjoying this fine session this evening as well. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, my name is Kimihiro Miyake. I am uh, going to be your moderator for this uh, post IYLA discussion. Uh, the, uh, I work with the, I am the youth uh, director. I'm the director of youth for the Global Peace Foundation here in the United States. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, the Global Peace Foundation has been one of the co-conveners for the International Young Leaders Assembly. Uh, the International Young Leaders Assembly started in Atlanta, Georgia, in partnership with the Points of Light Institute, as well as the Global Young Leaders Academy, uh, together with the Global Peace Foundation. And we uh, had a collaboration with the Martin Luther King Jr. King Center in Atlanta, Georgia, that year, in 2012. And in 2013, we were taking delegates from the World Bank in Washington, D.C., to Philadelphia and to conclude uh, to the United Nations in New York. And uh, our third uh, young International Young Leaders Assembly took place in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And this past summer, we continued again in the historic sites and uh, major cities in the East Coast. Uh, so we are very excited uh, to uh, we have this. This is actually the first time we had a post uh, call or post a program where we can invite speakers such as my panelists here uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, the theme of the International Young Leaders Assembly was moral and innovative leadership, vision, service, and entrepreneurship. Uh, the purpose of the theme is to recognize the necessity of uh, having moral leadership as well as innovative leadership in the rising generation. The, what we're seeing right now is a lot of challenges where uh, leadership, is, although leadership exists in name, uh, the challenge is the substance in terms of integrity, character, and uh, we see a lot of challenges all, all in every aspect of society and all over the world with issues like corruption and like so that we are seeing the necessity of moral leadership and also the importance of innovation because with the rising generation with a different as we are advancing technologically as we are becoming more globalized we're seeing the necessity to find new ideas to have new approaches to be able to address the pressing issues that our country and the whole world is facing so i want to read uh, a quote from uh, my, my international president when he was address, addressing the United Nations for the International Young Leaders Assembly, when he said, the theme of this forum is quite meaningful, moral and innovative leadership, vision, service, and entrepreneurship. This unique juxtaposition, moral and innovative leadership, we believe encapsulates the leadership, the leadership qualities needed for our time. A moral leader is guided by an ethical framework rooted in universal principles and shared values. The moral leader has integrity and is committed to advance the greater good before self-interest. And on the foundation of a solid ethical framework, innovative leadership can tap the wellspring of innate human creativity, ingenuity, and the power of innovation so that they can be channeled to address even the most intractable social problems. So this is a, a we uh, concluded at the United Nations uh, with the, this assembly. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we actually had a whole week full of programs where we brought international delegates from the Capitol, from Capitol Hill, the State Department, World Bank, the National Constitution Center, and concluding at the United Nations. And uh, we, uh, at the United Nations, we were able to uh, have a delegation of about 500 people from all around the world 
uh, young people who are thinking about wanting to contribute to society in some in some kind of aspect to those who started uh, their own organization and their own initiatives. And yet they were on that same platform at the United Nations talking about how to work together, how to advance and learning from others and leaders such as those on my panel here uh, to be able to take the next step in their personal life and also uh, those that are connected to them as well. So I am really happy to uh, have this discussion with all of you from around the world and want to include my, uh, introduce my uh, panel here and I want to uh, ask them that they can share a little bit about their organization and the work they do. And we have a series of questions that we want to uh, ask them. And uh, what we did at the United Nations is we had a panel of about eight uh, young leaders. And uh, we had so many uh, questions we want to ha ask them, but so little time. And actually, this is part of the reason why we wanted to continue this conversation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a bio of each of the speakers, and then I'll ask each of them to share about uh, their organization. Uh, so to my, I guess, right, my right, this is uh, Shauna Dressler. Shauna is the founder of Social Innovators uh, Collective. In 2011, Shauna founded the Social Innovators Collective. The organization's mission is to train and nurture the next wave of social change leaders so they can demonstrate measurable impact and achieve financial sus sustainability. In addition to her work with the Social Innovators Collective, Shauna also develops the, and leads classes on business development for social enterprise conferences at Harvard, Columbia, New York University, Brown, School of Visual Arts, Rhode Island's School of Design, and others. In 2014, she developed the curriculum for the Makers Institute a social good business school designed to support 21st century entrepreneurial problem solvers and creatives tackling the most pressing social and environmental challenges of our time. I will uh, give the mic to Shana to give an uh, explanation about her work and then I'll uh, introduce Jose uh, after that. So um, again, welcome everyone. Uh, we don't know where you're from, but this is exciting that we have people from all over. Uh, my name is Shauna Dressler, and um, I am the founder of the Social Innovators Collective, which came about um, after I tried to found a nonprofit in 2011 called the Global Giving Circle. Um, at the time, I had just finished working about 10 years in media for uh, a satellite TV station, and um, a lot of the broadcast that we were um, airing was a lot about international development and the problems around the world. And at a certain point, I um, was really proud of the work we were doing, but I wanted to be on the other side of the camera and really get um, you know, involved in a personal way with uh, trying to be helping people that needed help. And so I founded something that was going to be a crowdfunding platform in person. So we would come together, um, have people donate small amounts of money to do things like build a school or um, put together things that would be unaffordable for any of us individually, but together if we would uh, pull our funds, we'd be able to do it. Um, but I, I happened to uh, fail in a very uh, painful way by not doing a proper trademark search. And uh, without getting into much about what that is, what I learned from that experience was I didn't have the small business skills. I had a lot of passion and a lot of interest and um, a good plan of what I wanted to do ahead, but I think I, I didn't think enough about what it was going to take to run an organization. Uh, so from there, I, I decided that really what was needed in this space, um, I live in New York City, and so most of the people I was in touch with were from New York, was uh, our education, that a lot of us came out of very strong liberal arts backgrounds and had a lot of experience in sector-specific professions, like uh, we had two attorneys in the group and some people that had MBAs a few other people in advertising, but none of us really had the full suite of skills that you really need to run a business. And a nonprofit is indeed a business, which was also a big surprise because I just wasn't thinking that way. But actually, when you, in America, when you sign papers, they're actually called nonprofit incorporation papers. And uh, so right now, I've been developing a lot of curriculum to teach people that haven't gone back to school or um, you know don't have any interest in going back to school because it's very costly about you know, what are the broad um, skills that you need in order to really 
successfully uh, found and launch and be in business after a couple years, either a for-profit social enterprise or a nonprofit. Um, so that's my background. Great. Thank you, Shana. I really appreciate also for uh, you and Jose to take time uh, after hours because uh, I'm also in Seattle. So right now it's uh, four o'clock for me. So I really appreciate uh, both of you uh, for taking the time. Uh, next, uh, I want to introduce Jose uh, Fernandez. Jose Fernandez is ambassador of the Global Good Fund, head of its head of its New York chapter and a consular officer at the Consulate General of Spain in New York and has worked as trade officer for his embassy. Uh, Mr. Fernandez's international executive experience in L'Oreal, ING, and Banesto has been complemented with his service on the boards or commissions of various Spanish and international nonprofit organizations, including Amnesty International, the Global Good Fund, Suida. Danos, apologies, and Libertas. Uh, Mr. Fernandez has co founded and governed the nonprofit organizations Ves Publica, Asociación Nacional por la Libertad Lingüística, and Asociación Libre de Debate. <laughs> uh, you are JC in Spain, as well as co founded and managed business venture Fabrilis Sistemas. Um, even high school Spanish is giving me a hard time. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Fernandez, <laughs> Mr. Fernandez uh, has also been candidate to the European Parliament and local and regional elections in Spain. He has an executive MBA at, by the Univers Universidad Internacional Menendez Pelayo, graduated outstanding graduate of the year and valedictorian of the international business degree of the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos, is a certified chartered economist in Spain and is an experienced skydiver, scuba, scuba diver, sailor, rock climber, sky, a skier, motorcyclist, and martial artist. So he you knows how to have fun and kick some butt. So uh, please, uh, Mr. Fernandez, uh, introduce yourself and look forward to uh, hearing more about the Global Good Fund. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so the Global Good Fund was was born, I, I think, to understand the the real philosophy behind the Global Good Fund. You need to understand how it started. Carrie Rich, the co-founder and CEO of the, of the Global Good Fund, um, was working for for a company, and uh, she was very involved, like everyone else, in, in the Global Good Fund. Uh, before she was very involved uh, in uh, in uh, social entrepreneurship and social impact uh, as volunteer, she was just very interested in uh, in many ways of solving problems that she thought had a solution. And uh, when her um, her boss was very well aware, aware of her um, continuous interest in the subject, and when her uh, birthday came, her boss came to her and said, "You know, I was gonna." I was going to, um, he gave her this check for $2,000 and he was like, I was going to use this money for a dinner for the team in, uh, for your birthday. Anyway, how about you use this, uh, this money for, for one of your causes? And she was, um, very surprised. She, she took it as a mission and she did this very big research on all the organizations out there. They were doing a great job and they could they could do more, they could have the greatest impact with uh, with that money that she was offering. Um, so she did this uh, this really comprehensive research of the organizations out there, <clears throat> and finally gave um, gave the money divided it into uh, three projects of three different organizations around the world. But there was this huge amount of um, of uh, uh, for profits and not for profit organizations that were doing a great job of social impact. That did not get any money, and this really frustrated her. And so she, she, um, she wrote this email that she, um, um, you know, on the subject. She uh, she titled it the Global Good Fund, and she basically wrote uh, this email to everyone she had on her contact list um, from her, uh, you know, professional connections, personal connections, to see if anyone would donate any money 
um, to so that she could give something to all these other organizations that she had uh, discovered and had seen was inspired by the work they were doing. So, um, you know, people, friends and family um, gave her 20 bucks, 50 bucks, and then she, suddenly she finds herself with uh, this, um, this, this email of this man uh, um, telling her that uh, he would give her a million dollars. Now she was uh, kind of taken aback, and she uh, asked to meet him somewhere public because, uh, you know, she was worried he could be probably a psycho because that's the first thing I would think if someone offered to give me a million dollars. So um, she asked him if uh, he could, uh, you know, meet with her somewhere public uh, um, with a certified check for the million dollars, and he did. He appeared there, and they had, um, he asked for anonymity. And um, please excuse my, my English. I'm you know, originally from Madrid, Spain. My I I live in New York and work in New York. Uh, I've been living here for two years, but uh, right now I don't know if it's anonymity, anonymity. Anyway, uh, close enough, I'm sure. So um, he um, he did give her this certified check and uh, uh, to us uh, written to the Gold Fund, which of course did not exist at the moment. It was just the title of an email. She went back, running back to uh, to work, to, to her boss, and basically threw the check at him and said, look what you've done. Like This has started, this has spinned out of control. I don't know what to do with this money. I, I, you know, I find myself in this situation. She was all freaked out. And, um, and her boss, um, uh, you know, took the check and said, you know, if, you quit this, if you could quit your job and you dedicate yourself to this purpose, I'll match the $1 million. And that's how the Global Good Fund was, was, uh, was born. Um, $2 million and um, a few bucks from uh, friends and family. And uh, on the purpose, the, uh, the, uh, the mission of, of making the greatest impact with uh, the funds that were given. And uh, through the process, it has become a um, an example of uh, mentorship and uh, leadership training and uh, to the world for social entrepreneurs. The fellowship program that the Global Good Fund offers to its fellows is uh, like none other. It has developed a 360 um, evaluation process that um, is right now being um, investigated by many many universities in the U.S. Uh, for their social entrepreneurship leadership programs. Um, it's mentorship, it, everything pivots around a marvelous mentorship program where incredible business leaders of the United States and hopefully soon of the world are um, leaders of billion dollar companies, presidents of universities, uh, of huge organizations, um, tech startups, successful um, entrepreneurs have with uh, conv convinced about giving back, about the importance of giving back and helping those social entrepreneurs who have who are brilliant young social entrepreneurs who have a great idea but do not necessarily have all the skills to survive such a hostile environment like uh, like any business um, environment is. The fact that your idea is has a social impact does not make you um, uh, any less vulnerable to all the hostilities of the commercial world, of the open market, um, are doing those 15-month program of the, that the fellowship gives you, are, are being mentored by these paired one-to-one -one, uh, with these business leaders, plus through the grants of the Global Good Fund, are trained in what the 360 evaluation process will identify as those opportunities of um, improvement be it finance or public speaking, um, in order to, through those leaders, scale the operations of the of the, uh, of the organiz of their organizations and have a greater impact in their communities. Thank you, Jose. Really appreciate that, that, that information. Uh, it's amazing just how uh, when you are passionate about something and you take those steps, uh, you don't know what. Uh, many times we were all, always afraid to take the next step. And when she took that step out of her own initiative and then was uh, given a huge response, um, it's just a, a, a testament of uh, really uh, the kind of, uh, with good intention, we can really 
uh, so we, can, we don't know who's out there that will, is listening to us and uh, who can be of that kind of support. So uh, it's uh, amazing that that kind of uh, situation uh, uh, came about. So uh, I'm going to open this up to all of you online uh, through this uh, wonderful platform uh, of Vonvo. <coughs> Thank you, Max, for hosting us. And uh, I have a few questions uh, that I'm going to ask on my panelists today. Uh, and if you have any questions yourselves, please uh, jump on the chat box, and we will keep mindful of that and uh, monitor it. So I have a, my first question. Uh, we can start from Ch Chana and then go to Jose. Uh, we had a lot of panelists at the UN event. One of them was, uh, her name was Bella, who, uh, I'm sorry if I, I'm mispronouncing her name, is Huel from the World Trade Center Association. Um, and she shared about the importance of having core values. Uh, she even recommended that we put down three of our core values on our business cards, especially for those who didn't have any. So for Shana, uh, I want to ask, especially when we think about leadership, we always think about uh, what's inside of the person. And uh, so I want to ask, what are your three core values? And do you see these uh, core values reflected in the values of your organization? And how do the values of your organization shape the culture in your workplace? So uh, it's actually not just one question, it's actually three. So start with Sean. Um, so I guess I would start first with integrity. Um, when I am teaching in a lot of the presentations, I think when you decide that you want to do either um, or create a social enterprise or a nonprofit, uh, it's going to be much more costly than an organization that doesn't have the complexity of doing something that has uh, social impacts. You, you can't purport to be a socially responsible organization and you're um, using, I don't know, cleaning products that are from the evil empire or you're not treating your staff properly or you're not paying payroll taxes. Like there's all of these things that people want to cut corners because they want to have the most money for the people that they're serving or the programs. But if you haven't uh, identified where you're going to draw the line with what's right and wrong within what you're going to do as an organization, and if it doesn't align with who you are as a person, I think there's a huge disconnect that you just can't sleep um, well at night. And I think that's the difference between deciding you want to be somebody that's going to be uh, trying to do good in the world. It, 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 you can't just have it one way. It has to really be fully integrated in your, um, you know, in your entire self. And... Um, I think the second would be um, honesty. I think uh, it's really hard to tell the truth. And I think um, I've found that sometimes you're not the most popular presenter if you're the one that's actually going to come forward and say what, what there is to say or give a statistic that's not, um, you know, favorable or, or tell somebody that it's harder than most people will let, you know, let you think it is because you want to be liked and I think um, it's hard to to uh, you know I think we're all trying to be likable and be uh, respected by our colleagues and uh, but I think at the end of the day that if you really want to have impact that if you're not honest and you're not willing to take the consequences that come with being honest that you should rethink why you're in the social impact space and um, I would say the third is generosity um, I think a lot of people really respond well when they're acknowledged properly, uh, when you give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, actually, I would say really communication. So generosity, I don't know, maybe there's four, but, you know, I think if, let's just stay on the generosity uh, conversation. I think that there's something really important about, especially when you're working with people that are doing a lot of volunteer work, that you're not, um, that you give them titles that, that mean something, that you acknowledge because you're going to need a lot of help. You're going to need armies and armies of people. And to not take the time out to uh, be generous with them and acknowledge them and to follow up with ways you can help them. Um, you know, you, you don't build a team until you have an army of volunteers helping you before you can you have enough money coming in that you can actually hire people. And around the um, communication piece, I think that's essential. Without good communication, uh, there's just so much wasted time and energy um, especially we're all in a hurry to be helping people. And so I think um, everything that can go wrong 
uh, lean, yeah, I would say, you know, to be more on the side of making sure people understand what you mean, especially when you're speaking foreign languages and email is very hard to read nuance. There's just no way if you're not sure, um, you know, get on the telephone, which is something that uh, people 25 under are not as used to doing as those of us that are above 25. Um, you know, pick, pick up a telephone because if you can really sort out a problem, you can save so much time and misunderstanding, especially working internationally, you know, you could be um, offending somebody terribly because you don't have an awareness of uh, some, cult some cultural sensitivity issues um, and language barrier. So I, th I think those would be the three principles and um, they're the biggest, um, I think I, I feel the most sense of accomplishment and also these are the hardest, they've been the hardest, most challenging um, things to really stand by and keep showing up in that way and not making compromises. Yeah, especially uh, being honest with yourself is a really challenge. Uh, I think it's a, a learning experience, especially uh, as a leader. Uh, we always we are always uh, constantly learning, and uh, also we had a. I agree with the communications aspect too. So, uh, well, that, even sorry. Oh, the thing I was going to say about the honesty is everyone knows when people lie, and so you might as well tell the truth because the consequences is that you lose your reputation and you can't build that back. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to build a good re reputation. You, you shouldn't, you know, play with fire by trying to think you can get away with things because you just can't. Everyone knows everybody at a certain point. Somebody knows somebody that so, knows somebody and people talk. So, you know, I, I feel like with the interns I work with in New York City, I said, the, the most precious thing right now you have is your reputation. And if you're not honest, word gets out, and then nobody trusts you. You don't get money. It's just, uh, it, I don't know. Jose, do you have anything to say about that? I, I just feel like people don't say enough about the importance so we'll, of being. We'll go to, yeah, sorry. we'll go to uh, Jose uh, to share about his core value, three core values, and uh, how they reflect his organization as well. But yeah, thank you, Sharon. That was really uh, good advice. So I, I believe that. Honesty is the frame. Um, if there, if I mean, I don't, I don't personally have it as a core value because I just believe that that is the frame upon which we can build something. If there is no honesty, there is no framework, there is no basis upon which you can uh, build a relationship, be it professional, be it personal. I, I believe that honesty um, and its um, and its corollaries. Uh, the um, as you, as you were saying, um, your 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 rep, your um, um, the uh, basically everything that you can build up, uh, with someone, be it in a personal level or professional level, starts with being able to trust that person. So I start from trust, and uh, and stay. And once you have that, I my core values would be having a mission statement. I think that not only organizations but people should have a mission statement. They should know what they want to achieve. What is it? That they, what is their mission statement, their vision? Where, what, what do they want to change? It has to be something you're passionate about. It's actually the first thing I want to ask people when I meet them is, what are you passionate about? It's just that um, it's not socially acceptable as of yet, so I you know, kind of break the ice and then try to uh, get into it. So what are you passionate about? And because for me, that is that drive is what is most important in, in anyone. And uh, if you understand that drive within someone and that drive, that passion is aligned with yours, that's when uh, commercial uh, partnerships can happen. That's when you're hiring, um, when you become hireable in, in, an, in, in my point of view, in, in the organization I've been in hiring, visit, in, you know, um, the recruitment um, um, levels. Um, and, uh, and, and that mission statement has to be your purpose. I think that you, that you have to check everything you do against that purpose. If, uh, if, you're, if you don't have that mission statement clear, you really don't know. That's when doubts come in when you're uh, making important decisions for your organization. Uh, also, um, don't, and it's kind of a corollary at first, but it, I, I'd like to, to state very clearly that I don't think if you're in the, in the if you're into social entrepreneurship, if you're into social impact, you should not make it a professional project. Whatever you do, it should be a life project. It's something that goes beyond a nine to five work. Um, it doesn't matter at what point of the organization, uh, of what 
level of the organization you are definitely in the CEO level, but even if you're considering uh, uh, a management level within a large organization, you should not get into uh, social entrepreneurship um, as a professional project, as a professional career. It's a life project. You have to dedicate yourself for the, uh, to your purpose. That's like, It brings us back to the mission statement. If you are going to start a social business or you're going to get into an organization, be it a for-profit for, uh, for or not-for-profit um, organization of social impact, do not um, do not do it if it if it is not aligned with your purpose, if it, if it's not aligned with your mission statement. Because you, what you want to do is have that mission statement clear, and then choose uh, an organization that it whose work inspires you, or, or if there is none, you know, make something that will inspire others, and then devote yourself to it. And the last one, would, the third one for me would would be um, they, um, this is something that my Taekwondo master taught me when I was a kid, and I, it really, really uh, made an impression on me, and it's something that I've always kept in my mind. If you see something that is wrong, do something about it. Do not look aside. Do not act as if you did not see it. If you do not have the skills, the resources to change it, and you think and you still think it's wrong, then acquire them or get you know someone with the executive power to change it, to change it, to do something. Awesome. And uh, that's why we're here. And uh, I realize actually time goes by so quickly, and there's so much actually that uh, uh, our panelists here want to share. Uh, so I, I want to ask if they can also be uh, concise, so we can get any more questions. And uh, already we have a few questions. So from uh, Max K, uh, we have a few questions. So I will maybe uh, address. Uh, uh, I would address one of you, maybe uh, if you wanted to raise your hand like that, and then. I can let you uh, take the floor, and then uh, we can go from uh, question to question. So is uh, fundraising the biggest issue for social entrepreneurs? So who wants to take that? Is fundraising the biggest issue for social? OK, so Jose? I, I can. I mean, I don't. Um, it's a problem. I think that um, I think that that, that is um, one of my uh, main obsessions is getting social businesses to be uh, like I, I personally think that a social business that social entrepreneurs are the bridge between the, the not-for-profit world and the business world and they take the best of both ends I think that if if you uh, achieve if you create if you produce a product or service that makes you economically sustainable while having a social impact you can now forget uh, you can now focus on, on your on the bis on your business core while being able to make projections into uh, long-term projections because you have uh, a model that is economically sustainable thanks to the, the, the product of your, of your business. Um, I believe that it's, that it's a, great, a great problem, that fundraising is a great problem for, for great not-for-profit organizations because they become machines of fundraising and they lose the focus. CEOs have to be invested in those fundraising because sponsors do not want to have to deal with Managers or middle middle managers or, or executives of a of non for profit. They want to hear the story of the CEO. The CEO then has to divide his time from his vision, his or her vision, and and purpose, and has to go and spend more and more time with sponsors and donors and uh, philanthropists, explaining the story, getting getting them getting it to appeal to their hearts, and that they no matter how successful they become, they have to. Uh, spend more and more time getting that money, fundraising, and therefore detracting from the focus of their organization. And it's it, for me, it's just one of those things. For me, every organization, every for me, every for-profit organization should have a social impact. I think it's a um, it's a characteristic that should be considered for every consumer in every product. Just like you buy an iPad and consider what the RAM is compared to other um, uh, tablets, and if you buy a coffee and consider the taste compared to other coffees, you should consider what social sort of impact that product and service you're, you're having has on the world. I also think that not-for-profits should have a, um, a, a reliable, sustainable economic model. I, I, just, I think both should be centered because too much, uh, way too much effort and attention is given by CEOs and presidents of not-for-profits to fundraising. 
Thank you, Jose. Uh, Shana, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would just kind of underscore what Jose said about the impact piece. Um, you know, the, the difference between a, a, a nonprofit or a for-profit is, uh, you know, a for-profit, if they can't figure out a way to sell a, a service or, um, you know, they just go out of business. A nonprofit, as long as they have money coming in, it, you know, they can have no impact and they still can be in, in business. So I think at the end of the day, the real um, the real key is if you can't figure out not only what the impact you're going to make, but actually see that it's happening, then nothing else matters. So if that's not what you're starting off with, what kind of difference do you want to make and how are you going to make it? Um, if, if you're not really satisfying that, you can see lots of uh, dollars come in and go out and it doesn't mean that you're really achieving anything. So that, that would be what I would say. And, and fundraising is an essential part of the success. But I think at the core of why you're doing what you're doing is you have to figure out what you care about. And like, I totally agree with you, Jose, that if it isn't something that's really about your personal life mission and somebody that, you know, being somebody that is of service and you, you really start to see that it's not about you and it's really about helping other people and you're in, you're in part of that equation. Uh, you can't figure out the impact piece and, and the fundraising doesn't matter because a lot of money gets spent. There's billions of dollars that is, you know, comes from the, the first world, goes into the bank accounts of the developing world and does absolutely nothing. And it's just, you know, very, very sad to see that happening. And there's plenty of reports on this. I'm not making this up. You can, you know, there's even the UN has plenty of reports that, you know, they let you know what they tried to do and what had, didn't happen, especially with the millennial development goals coming to a finish at the end of next year. And, um, you know, they have to, if they're going to be, you know, really honest with the public about what's happening, they, I think they're starting to release a lot of reports around that. And then there's a whole new campaign coming uh, to hopefully uh, follow up where, where the millennial development goals uh, fell short. So that's what I would say. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, impact, I really agree. You know, uh, we can't lose sight of our original purpose of why what we're trying to accomplish, uh, especially when we get caught up in organizational matters. And uh, I really appreciate your comments from both of you. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, to be able to uh, really make concrete and lasting impact and <coughs> utilizing the, the funds effectively that we have to do that. Uh, so this is... Um, Good discussion point. On top of the, when we're talking about funds right now, I'm actually gonna, sorry, uh, Max K, I'm gonna jump to Deja C, who uh, asks, is asking uh, Jose uh, about your organization. Uh, she's, at, uh, I think she's asking, do you know, do you know what the smallest organization the Global Good Fund has funded is? Do you know? I, I don't know, I don't know what the smallest would be. Um, there is no minimum, however, n nor in in volume, economic volume, nor in uh, participation of uh, people employed. It's uh, It requires the project to be a, re a reality. It has to have two years of, uh, of existence, at least. Um, uh, but the, uh, the Global Good Fund has, that has helped very small operations. What we look for is um, for, for organizations that have a great potential. They can already be a big, uh, a big player. But if they have the potential to internationalize, um, imagine uh, we have we have a health uh, an organization that would um, give uh, electricity to solar panels to the most uh, uh, inaccessible places in Mexico. But they had the potential, and they were already a successful uh, business venture. Uh, but they had the potential to, to grow to the whole of Latin America, so so we we um, we helped them out. But um, we've also helped very small operations. Um, in uh, right now, we're through the uh, grading process of the 2014 to 2015 fellows, and some operations. This I remember grading this uh, this um, this candidate was a, an operation in Uganda, who is uh, very small. Um, of manufacturer, of manufacturer, actually some manufacturer in Uganda that has a lot of potential. So um, it it doesn't really matter how small the uh, the organization is. It matters how much potential it has and what impact, what social impact it's having. Great. Uh, 
great. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Can I Sarah. Make a comment. So my comment for those of you out there that actually are looking for funding, <clears throat> or you spend months and months and months looking for funding and learning how to write a grant or learning how to meet people, go find yourself an amazing mentor because a mentor will get you farther faster than money because if you don't know what to do with that money and you don't know how to spend that money, you're going to run through it where a mentor can really set you up in a way that will help you exponentially get to where you want to go. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is do figure out your mission, write it on the mirror that you look at every day because so much of the game and the reason why this is a, you know, you're a lifer once you get into this is it is hard. And if you aren't tenacious and you're not going to hold on with brass knuckles, um, you know, and, and at every pass when something's difficult, if you're going to decide you're going to jump from, you know, child slavery to uh, environmental things or whatever, you know, solar panels in Uganda, you know, you're not, you're not going to have any impact. So really, really figure out very ask yourself those hard questions, what do you really, really care about, and then stick with it. <laughs> because this is a, this is a long-term game. This is not a, a down and dirty, and quick in and out at all. That's, anyway, I, I, that might have been totally irrelevant, but I felt like it wasn't important to share. Not, re not irrelevant at all, no. <laughs> Everything is connected, uh, so I really appreciate that, those comments. And, you know, you guys can totally go off script. I uh, don't have to follow my own pop too, so I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going back to Max K., uh, second question was, uh, oh, and by the way, anyone else who's joining us still, uh, can you can still add questions even though we have very limited time. What are the most common ways of social entrepreneur markets, their social cause, NFP, uh, non-for-profit organizations, and businesses? So I'm going to go to Shauna this time, uh, so if you want to ask. Uh, marketing, so, right? Is that, did I understand that right? So question about marketing? Yes, how do you... Uh, most common ways of marketing. I uh, see. I don't think there's. I think you have to know what it is before you can figure out the vehicle for marketing. So, um, so I'll, I'll, we're putting together something called the Social Good Guide. I'll type into the chat box at the end, and uh, basically they're small business guides to answer all of these questions. And one is on marketing, and it's a very general guide. But the, the problem with marketing is that. If you have a service, that's going to be a different strategy than if you have a product, which is a different strategy than if you're a nonprofit versus a for-profit versus what country you're in. There's so many variables to marketing that it's really hard for me to kind of give you the formula um, of how to do it. But I think the best thing would be, and I don't know where you're from, but if you look to see how the big fortune 100 companies market to all of us and you start looking as a not as a consumer of marketing but as a student of marketing and look why why is it that you buy the soft drink that you buy or why is it that you buy the sneaker brand that you buy like what what are you what is appealing to you that you go and do what you do and when you start to get into the mindset of what marketers do to get attention it's it's a great way to learn because you'll start to see what you're interested in and you'll start to see what what spoke to you that you did whatever it was you did. It's, it's, I feel terrible because I would love to give you a specific, but I need to know more to really say anything that's valuable. But I think, um, first of all, marketing is really the essential piece between having a business or nonprofit or not. Even nonprofits need to market. You could have a fantastic um, business and if you can't get it out to the public, whether that be for them to buy something from you or to donate to you, you're basically nowhere. Um, and also, I think if you can market in an effective way, you're going to be selling more or receiving more um, donations. And also, who you're marketing to. So, for instance, if you want to get to the to youth as opposed to people that are over 65, there's uh, very specific ways that you need to do. And so much of this is about market it's research. Um, so, I don't know if either of you want to jump in. It's just such a general question. It's hard to, I wanted to give you something that will be valuable. Jose, you want to add anything? No, I, I agree. Um, you just have to, so social entrepreneurs and the leaders of non-profit organizations have to understand that what they have, what their organizations do are, uh, is either offering a service or a product. I, I, my, my, we, in Spain, we say de formación profesional. I have a, I've been working in the private sector for half of my life and in the other half in the 
diplomatic sector. Um, so it's they always tell me when I'm when I'm working uh, in, uh, in not-for-profit organizations and, and government-related organizations that um that I my my terminology is very it's very private sector-like because I always see everything as a as a, a product, a service, even if it's just an idea of a, of a political party. I see everything as, a, as something that has to be sold, and it sounds like a very aggressive um, vocabulary to use sometimes because you have to sell an idea that does not sound very socially acceptable, but it works. Um, if you find everything can be broken down into a service that you have to sell, a product that you have to sell, and uh, even if it's just if it's just a notion um, or an impact, so understanding that is very helpful when you when you um, when you have to analyze the fact that every organization lives in a hostile environment because it is a hostile environment. Uh, non for profits have competitors that they have, that they have to fight against, and they have. Um, in order to survive, them, which is healthy, because that all that conflict is healthy. It makes them more efficient. It makes them it makes them strive for better ideas, for a, a bigger impact with uh, uh, with the resources that they're given, and um, and you just have to. And that makes marketing all the more important because you could have the best idea possible, but if no one knows, um, I no, you're not going to be able to do anything with that idea. You're not going to be able to make it turn it into action and therefore impact. Uh, I one of the greatest examples that I can think of right now is the many organizations that have tried to uh, build wells to give clean water to Africa, and then Charity Waters, one of their representatives, came uh, to the IYLA event in the United Nations. Charity Waters basically what became a game changer in exclusively through marketing. Um, of course, their operation was very good. Their the, how their the GPS tracking of their of their projects in in, in Africa when they were constructing wells and how the resources were used and how everyone who gave even a dollar could see what project and what that was being used for it was all marvelous, but it was none of that was new. It was all, already all being used. But their marketing, you just you have to see the the what the, their social their their activity in social media is groundbreaking. Their designs, their their marketing is amazing. And they've they've stand, they've They've showed the world that a non for profit can be a marketing genius. But the but the the um, flip side to that is you could have phenomenal marketing and have a zero product, or you could have a non profit that looks nice and shiny and doesn't run. So, uh, but but it's you know you need to be in the game to win it. So you know we're hoping that if you're listening to this, you are somebody that's interested in, in you know, putting together and designing something that does have value and is doing something. But the truth of the matter is, is some of these household name nonprofits in America that we know, there are probably 20 other organizations doing a lot more impact, but they're not as interested in, in um, you know, getting into everybody's inbox because they have a mission and a vision and they've got a scope of work that they want to get done. So it's better to know all of this stuff and use it for good, but marketing can also be used for evil, <laughs> as we can see. Uh, so then the next question is, is there a need for uh, helping people uh, assist, uh, having a, uh, helping people uh, market for their causes? Yes, and the problem is that a lot of nonprofits don't understand how important it is and don't <clears throat> want to pay for it. But I think you're right, like Charity Water has definitely change the game, the design is exquisite, the navigation works, um, you know, they, they, they've done advertising, they've done beautiful exhibitions in New York, and at the, bo at the bottom line is, um, and then I'll go back and answer the question, but think about it, if you're looking for somebody to cut you a million dollar check, somebody that can afford to let go of a million dollars is eating at fancy restaurants, is, is, uh, has bought a multi-million dollar condominium, maybe has two, drives nice car, they are a consumer of very high design. So if you have some schlocky website or some, you know, terrible packaging, you're not going to get the kind of donor or uh, purchaser if you don't have, haven't spent time on marketing and that you're looking at high quality design. So uh, Charity Water can command a lot of people to be donating a lot of money because they're used to seeing that level of design. Um, going back to do people need it, they do, and um, I think a lot of us are also hoping the part of the impact we could make is to let people know, and especially in the nonprofit sector, 
how important it is to have a line item in a budget for marketing and design because it translates into dollars and dollars spent wisely translate into more impact. Okay, uh, I, uh, we're getting close to the wire. Uh, we did promise one, one hour and there's so much that can be, again, conveyed. So uh, one more uh, coming from Max K. He said, thank you for the answers. Uh, sorry for being so general. Is a charity water trend trying to leverage social media marketing? Uh, if he want, if uh, I want to volunteer my time and assist in social media marketing for non for profit, is that something I can do? Uh, I don't, I don't know that they will need any help, <laughs> but there a lot of others do. <laughs> a lot of others do. Um, I can put a couple of uh, organizations that are on the web that you could uh, uh, volunteer services through. And um, also there's an organization called Social Media for Nonprofits. And that might be another good place to figure out how you could volunteer your time, but um, I'll put some things in the chat box. We can't hear you again. Uh, so Max said that he didn't uh, necessarily mean Charity Water specifically, just in general. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, great. Actually, we're, uh, I apologize, we're getting close to the end. Uh, so I want to ask one, uh, a couple more questions if you have time. Uh, so one of them is, uh, especially like, uh, Sean, you mentioned that you failed when you first started. Uh, and my question is, uh, it's very easy to be comfortable and take the easy way out and run away from challenges. Uh, but Dr. King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So I'm wondering uh, for both of you, what do you do when you face difficult moments and what keeps you motivated to continue what you do? Um, yeah, I think failure is very confronting. We're, we're all socialized to, uh, to look down on failure and to feel shame around failure. Um, but I think you have to, the more you're ready to fail, then you can get to success a lot quicker. It's, there's just no way you're not going to have bumps along the road. Um, so for me personally, um, for me, I just love being out in nature. I think it's also uh, living in a big city and being in a very intense city. Um, for me, when I just kind of need to clear my head or just, you know, start thinking about different things, um, you know, I'll, I'll just either... I drive around uh, New York on a Vespa, so that's one of the things I do, but um, there's a lot of great parks. So I think, you know, if you get away from people and chatter and conversations, I've got a motorcycle enthusiast uh, <laughs> here with me, so you understand my love of speed. Um, but I think something about disengaging so you can kind of get into your own quiet space or, you know, meditative space so that you can really unplug from what's happening. What was the third part of the question? Uh, I believe there's only two questions, but okay. it was, uh, what keeps you motivated to continue? Oh, I mean, I think once you hook into your heart and you really feel what you care about and you see something that, you know, puts an indelible image in your mind. And the one I shared at the UN was um, seeing a, a young boy in uh, Dakar in Senegal who I'm assuming had polio, you know, go across the street by trying to, you know, he had his hands on two pieces of cardboard and pulling himself across the street. And then another man I saw in India that had no arms and no, no legs that was on a moving cart with a friend pulling it with a tin can in his mouth, trying to beg for money. And I just, those images will never leave me. And I just thought, you know, I want to live a life that means something to me and other people. And, and I knew it was going to take me a while to figure it out. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more you know, twists and turns to the road. But I think once you really engage on an emotional level, um, you know, you, you can't go back. You you just, there's only forward at that point. Jose? So um, I I used to be very, very afraid of, of failure. More than failure, I used to be when I was, uh, when I was young, younger. When I was younger, um, I used to be um, terrified of, of people passing judgment of, about about being on a headlight, being under under the spotlight, and, and making a mistake, and letting everyone see me make a mistake. But um, uh, things passed. Things occurred to me when I was uh, when I was younger, where I had to to make decisions, um, and I, I I failed terribly, 
Um, and I, that happened all through high school. Um, I was failing terribly on a bunch of things. But it taught me so much because I realized that nothing really happened um, other than me learning a lot. And when I did succeed, for, my, for the first time, my, my first greatest success, which is nothing, but it was my first greatest success, um, it was my own. Because I had, I had made my way there, making my own decisions. My, I, it would have been easier to follow other people's um, dictates. In this case, it was uh, me, instead of following what my family would have wanted me to study and what my um, society thought that was a better use of my time um, as a, you know, dedicating myself to, uh, to things that are more profitable and that are socially understood as, as more successful or, or, or taking you towards success, I took the risk of, of choosing my own path. And, and I, while doing so, I was opening myself to failure because it's easy when you, you, know, when you follow other people and you're not, you, you stop being the leader of your own life, you, your failures are not your own anymore because now it's the advice of other people that brought you there. But when I did, when I did fail, and the failures were my own, because people were looking at me like, "Oh, you know that, you know, you made those those wrong mistakes, so that failure is your own." I own that, and when I did manage to succeed, I realized that that success was mine as well. It was not to be taken by anyone else. No one told me to go there. No one told me to do that to follow that path. Everyone was telling me to do otherwise, and I. I felt that the right the right place for me was, was was going in that direction. I did, and I realized that when I did succeed, even though it took a while, it was that feeling could have could have not have happened without uh, with me following other people's instructions for the rest of my life. Um, and that kind of you know also I've I've always been a person of overcorrections, so that took me into a, uh, a life of, of taking a lot of risks and and putting myself into situations that would. Uh, require a lot of me because I love the thrill of of taking a challenge and succeeding. Um, and you know, as uh, Shannon was talking about, um, I I love motorcycles. Everyone was, uh, you know, motorcycles in the cities I've lived are are uh, a threat to yourself because you know, from New York to Madrid, you just you're, you're confronted with so much traffic. But the, you know, when you do um, manage yourself around and you do get, I even, I, I even, um, uh, I, I, I love motorcycles so much. I, I actually raced, uh, in amateur competitions and people there were crazy and you fall, you find yourself when you find, when you put yourself in a situation where people are more experienced than yourself and you survive that it, it, even if, even if you don't, but if you manage to survive <laughs> and, uh, that is already a success. You are proving you can you can put yourself into a situation in which you're, you have to improvise, in which you have to to um, uh, analyze quickly in things that are constantly. The more you lead uh, your life, the more you're going to be ready when that when that moment comes where you're going to have to defend a budget in a, in a meeting where you haven't been giving all the information. The more you're going to going to have to improvise when it comes to, uh, when, when you're in a business in a in a sailing. Um, situation where you know it all depends on what you say in that moment so put yourself out there open yourself to failure because when you succeed it's a fleeting moment but when you fail the process of learning the, the many things you can improve about yourself from small failures no matter how small they are the more you can improve the more the more you fear that failure the more you can improve when you overcome it and um so yeah just just i am so I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of digressing because I do that a lot. I'm sorry. Um, when facing difficult moments, I I try to be um, so I like to put myself into difficult moments, but I, I need to um, remember my role models because I I'm impatient and I have so many flaws. I need to remember the people I respect, and I I need to tell everyone, please find role models, uh, find mentors, um, ask. Whenever you find someone you appreciate, whenever you find someone who inspires you, ask them. You'll be surprised how many will actually answer your emails or your questions after class or even in working environments. Whatever boss you actually um, look up to when you ask them, many of them will actually give you the advice that you, that you ask on them. And don't, don't be afraid to, to be inspired by people because it, it's, it's scary to, to, to do it, but... Um, it's, you know, when you think, what would this person do? 
it makes it automatically changes your perspective and you're open to so many more ideas and then what keeps my um what keeps myself motivated um the so the, the fellows the social entrepreneurs i found in this that for me the most fulfilling part of of um the social impact arena are its uh, agents its players the social entrepreneurs that i've met have not only restored my faith in humanity but they motivate me whenever i fail i remember the thousand stories i've heard um during panels seminars coffees after uh, after after meetings you know with people and after impact investing meetings and the, the coffees i'll have with the social entrepreneurs um, after that i'm always interested in their personal story and i am so inspired because it is so hard and it has been so hard for all of them the lack of resources because we do not know what what having no infrastructures whatsoever it, it, it is when your operation is based in um in Uganda and uh you know we, that is what keeps me motivated just remember that you know we are privileged and that whatever feat you're trying to accomplish there's people that have accomplished more with less can i just add one more thing oh yes I totally agree. Don't be afraid of failure, but do not try and do this stuff and and fail on other people's uh, you know, well-being. Don't start and get get into communities that you don't come from and jump on airplanes where you don't know languages and cultures and fail for these people that are just, you know, they're just getting by with with a little, tiny little bit of hope and for you to come in inexperienced and not know what you're doing and not be properly set up for, you know, the funding and everything else and all the complexity that it is to either run a nonprofit or a for-profit that at that point, it almost becomes unethical for any of us to go in and screw up and dash people's hopes and put them into a worse spot than when you got there. So be really thoughtful about learning on all of these things you need to like, you know, sharpen your teeth, do it without impacting other people. Learn as much as you can learn. Volunteer for organizations. Get yourself into mentorships. Go back to school, but don't just, you know, if your strategy is I'm going to figure it out as I do it, you're going to fail and you're going to hurt a lot of people. So that's really where you want to be careful about failure is when it involves other people, you know, other people's li life and well-being. That has touched something very, very important. The sooner you fail when your responsibilities are, are, are less, the less people you're going to hurt when your responsibilities are, are more. So I completely agree. Do not do not get your, do not put yourself a hat that you're not ready for. Fail in in the in the early stages so that you might be ready when when you're actually when the the the, the, the destiny of other people, other hardworking artists and other hardworking people in in places or in undeserved communities are counting on you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much and. Uh... We are over time, uh, so I really appreciate all of you who were able to come on uh, this uh, call for our first official post IRA discussion. Uh, but I do want to ask very quickly, in 10 seconds, maybe less, uh, how Shana uh, and also Jose, our uh, audience here, are able to connect with you or your organization after this uh, call is over. So. Um the best way to connect with me is I'll put my email in here, but if you sign up for the um, Social Good Guides newsletter, you'll learn about the launch of these guides. And my email is just shauna at socialgoodguides.com, but I'll put it in the... Um... Oh, and the other thing I was going to say is if you're seeking out help, be succinct. Do not ramble, send somebody four paragraphs. Don't get on the phone and keep talking. Be really clear about what you want from the, from anybody because they're really busy and they'll be much more um, willing to help you if you help them understand what it is you want to know from them. And secondly, that you don't just ramble. You lose a lot of power in rambling. Uh, Jose? Sign sign up um, to the newsletter of the Global Good Fund on the Global Good Fund's page. It's globalgoodfund.org. I'm going to write it on the chat now. And uh, write me an email. Uh, my email is jose.fernandez at globalgoodfund.org. I'll also write it on the chat so people can just add it there. Great. And thank you very much to our panelists and uh, also for this wonderful platform uh, hosted by uh, Vonvo. Uh, Vonvo was a, a, did a great service. They were a major partner with the International Young Leaders Assembly at the UN and also for this follow-up meeting. So thank you, Max.
And uh, shout out to Rondo. So thank you everyone for this call, and thank you for everyone to making that time. We'll see you again another chance, another opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Uh, good, or good morning. Good morning. Or wherever good you are. <laughs> <laughs>